I'm Rick Edelman. If you're saving for your retirement and you want to buy a house, when is it okay to dip into your retirement savings for that? Uh, how about never? Plus, how will Moore's Law impact our future? What is Moore's Law? I'll tell you. And Gene has a few choice words on choosing the right words in The Other Side of Money. All that and more on this edition of The Truth About Money. program is funded in part by TD Ameritrade. At TD Ameritrade, we support investors and independent registered investment advisors every day, providing access to tools, research, and educational resources that help you pursue your goals with confidence. I'm Ed Burns. I've spent a lot of time around cameras. However, I've never actually swallowed one before. Till now. It's a camera the size of a pill that lets your doctor see inside of you. That's uh, kind of awesome. Technology is evolving. We believe the way to invest should evolve as well. A prospectus is available at 1-800-iShares, which includes investment objectives, risks, fees, expenses, and other information that you should read and consider carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. I'm Rick Edelman. You have many financial goals, but what do you do when they conflict? Should you use retirement savings, for example, to help you buy a home? The decision can seem emotional, but it's really just dollars and cents. Hi, Rick. Given that the real estate market and interest rates are so low right now, do you suggest that I take a loan against my 401k to put as a down payment on my house? Absolutely, positively not. I know real estate prices are a lot lower than they were five years ago, and interest rates have never been lower, which means houses have never been more affordable, and it's a wonderful time to buy right now, but you need to find the money another way. Do not use the money in your retirement account to help you buy a home. The money in your retirement account is for retirement. A 401k is not designed to help you buy a house, buy a car, pay off debts, go to college, none of that. Your retirement account is for retirement. I know you wanna buy a house, but the bottom line is, if you don't have the cash, if you can't afford the payments, then it's a lousy time to buy a house. It doesn't really matter what's going on in the marketplace. Too many people get themselves in too much trouble by diverting resources from other places for a sole subject. Uh, they'll do whatever, whatever it takes to buy the car of their dreams or the house of their dreams, and they sacrifice other fundally, fundamentally important goals. Do not use the money in your retirement account for anything other than retirement. And here's another question that just makes dollars and cents. My financial question is, how to avoid taxes the same way that the top 1% avoids taxes? Make as much money as the top 1%. I mean, it's really that simple. The fact is that the top 1% are not avoiding taxes in any special, unique way. They are dealing with the tax code in much the same way as you are. There are two basic elements of the tax code. There's a tax on earned income, a salary, and there's a different tax on capital gains, meaning the, the profits that you earn from investments. You simply want to reduce your income from earnings and increase your income from investments. That's how the top 1% do it. In other words, you don't want to be totally dependent on your job. You want to be increasingly dependent on stocks and bonds and real estate. If you own lots of those things and they generate lots of income, you get rent from real estate, you get dividends from stocks, you get interest from bonds, those taxes are lower than the taxes you pay at your job. I know you're saying, that's just not fair, because only rich people can buy those things. Why is it that therefore rich people get to benefit from the lower tax rate? This is Congress's way of saying to you, become an owner. You need to get yourself out of indentured servitude, get yourself out from employment where you work for someone else, and be the person 
who owns that job. The business owner, the person who owns real estate and stocks and bonds, are the true beneficiaries of capitalism, the basis of our economic system. From New York's newsrooms to the Hollywood Bowl, we traveled all over the U.S. to get celebrities' take on personal finance. We asked them just one question, Celebrity Edition. How do you raise children in Hollywood? I made sure that they got a job. One was a, a you know, a, a box boy at Ralph's. Sean Cassidy was my son, you know, and he was a giant rock star. And one of uh, Sean's big jobs was uh, uh, at, in, in New York at Madison Square Garden. And Marty and I were there seeing his one of his first concerts, you know. And after the show, I said, where can I see my son? They said, well, you'll just have to wait in the alley. The, the limousine will come riding out, you know, <laughs> with him. And Marty and I were waiting in the, in the, in the, in the alley, and all of a sudden, the car, that's him, that's him. And <laughs> went up to the car, and he opened the window, and uh, Marty said, well, the show is wonderful. And he turned to me and he said, you still want me to be a box boy at Ralph's? And up went the window. <laughs> How can college grads compete for jobs? I recently sat down with some students at Roger Williams University and offered them some tips. As a senior graduating in May, there's clearly a clear emphasis on being employed about at graduation. And uh, you know, I've been on a bunch of job interviews and it's, it's tough to set myself apart from you know, the millions of other students graduating this year, and I was wondering if there's any advice that you could give me that can kind of set me apart, or what you look for in app applicants for positions at your form, or what you think is kind of the normal advantage that might land me the job. It depends on the type of job you're looking for, uh, obviously. But as, a, uh, as someone who does a lot of hiring um, of people, we'll, we'll hire probably 150 people this year. There are a couple of things we, we look for. We accept it as a given that there's a certain level of knowledge you have by virtue of your degree. We also take it as a given that the school you went to was quality and gave you a quality education. So that's not sufficient, and as you pointed out, the education is something that everybody can claim that they have. You've all got a bachelor's degree. Great, fabulous, that's not really it. We're looking for two other things. The first thing we're going to look for is demonstrated experience outside of the classroom. Don't just show me that you went to class, and don't even just show me that you got a decent GPA. Show me that you were involved in extracurricular activities that demonstrated leadership, that demonstrated initiative, that demonstrated what we'll call gumption. Show me that you're someone of merit, someone who is some that it stands up above the crowd through, uh, and it doesn't have to be extracurricular activities in the sense of you were a member of a club or a leader of a club, it may be that you helped put yourself through school and that not only did you go through a full set of coursework, but you were working part-time as well doing that. That shows that, that you're working really hard, that you've got a strong work ethic. So show me that you're a stand-up person in that regard. Second, answer a fundamental question for me. How is it you're going to contribute to the success of my organization? Your generation gets a bad rap by a lot of folks in my generation. They're saying that all you care about is what's in it for you. That you're the me generation, you're the instant gratification generation, you're not willing to work hard, you're not willing to put in the time necessary, you wanna come into my organization and instantly be a manager. That you're not willing to start at the bottom and prove yourself. That's a bias, that's a prejudice. In my experience, it's not entirely true. But there have been enough pockets of this example among your generation that you have to overcome that. So you've gotta come in to the job interview with me and demonstrate your capabilities and your desires and your willingness to say, I'm not gonna give it all I've got. I'm gonna give it whatever it takes. Because sometimes all you've got isn't enough. Sometimes you gotta give it more than all you've got. You've got to reach deep down into your belly and give it everything that it takes. Demonstrate to me that that's what you're going to do for my organization. And if you can convince me of that, I'll demonstrate for you the willingness to give you the opportunity to try. As opposed to saying, I'm just trying to get as much as I can so I can get the heck out of here and go on to my next gig where I'll have a better opportunity. So you want to demonstrate that you understand that employers are generally rather selfish people. The employer wants to know, what can you do for me that's going to help my organization move forward? And if you can demonstrate that, you'll be standing head and shoulders above 
your competitors who are your fellow graduates. True or false, getting a tax refund is good news. Think about that and we'll be right back with the answer. We've all heard of Murphy's Law, but what do you know about Moore's Law? Singularity University's Rob Nail explains that Moore's Law is transforming our world. Obviously, technology is uh, where everything is headed. And Singularity University, of which you are the CEO, is focused exclusively on the subject of technology. Why is it such a big deal? Well, I mean, technology, you could you can make a case that technology has been the lead of every great progress in society through time, right? We've got the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution. All of these things have actually added up to a quality of life improving. That's not slowing down, and, and it's probably the case more so today than any other time. We're at the forefront of a complete revolution of education, healthcare, transportation, you name it. Every industry is being disrupted by technological breakthroughs. We're at an interesting time right now where those breakthroughs could go in a couple different directions. They could go uh, really badly for humanity so because people don't understand where technology is today. Because I think a lot of folks fear that the technology wonks are sitting in their lab yeah. building great widgets yeah. without any real consideration as to what that widget might do to humanity. Yeah, we need to educate our policymakers and and as sort of taxpayers and, and innovators and, and good citizens, we should be thinking about what technology is capable of today and making policy decisions in that light rather than the political light of 200 years ago when the system was set up. How can we do that? How can we learn more? How do we get more aware of these issues? Well, the first thing is to, to actually rethink about what technology is and what it's capable of and get involved with the conversation. Fight against the dark side, right? Drone technology is a great one that we should be talking about more, right? Putting weapons on autonomous vehicles is a very, very scary thing that um, has uh, no good end to it. Today, the government, you know, the Defense Department has a, a, a strong policy that autonomous systems uh, will not have weapons. A weapon will always um, have a human interface to say, okay, to kill or not. Uh, but the U.S. is just one small factor, and drones are very cheap to make, and so. We need to know about that and, and get involved with the public discourse and be talking to our representatives in the government because this is, a, this is a very scary time and we need to understand what the technology is capable of and be part of that conversation. The potential of all of these technological breakthroughs is that we can solve the biggest problems facing humanity, poverty, education, food, water, energy. And we basically want to look at how do we use those big breakthrough technologies to solve those big problems, and so it's very much applied. The interesting element of technology is that it is, for most of us, looking at it from the outside, relatively slow moving. We, right. we were an agricultural society for the first several thousand years, right. and then over a period of a generation, we moved from everybody working in the fields to right. everybody working in the factories. Yep. There's an assumption, therefore, that we're going to move to the next level at an equally leisurely pace. Mm -hmm. Not so, though, is it? No, not at all, and, and it's all rooted in this, um, the concept concept of exponential change. So basically all these technological breakthroughs are, are being driven by a different way of thinking about technology. It's, it's, it's largely around Moore's law, um, around this exponential curve of uh, computer processing power. But it's exponential in nature, so it's doubling every year, every two years, such that that linear line continues forward, but the exponential curve starts in those doubling patterns, takes up at such a rate that when those two intersect, it changes the mindset. What happens is it's changing so fast that it seems chaotic. It seems hap like it's happening so fast that it seems miraculous and we, we can't believe it, right? It took 40 years for the average American home to get a television. Exactly. But it took two years for the average American home to get a cell phone. Perfect, exactly, that's a great example. And now it's a smartphone. You can download so many different apps today around our personal health. Right? You can, you can act, literally take your, your blood pressure, your uh, heart rate, and then it's got a camera and you can have all kinds of lenses. 
And one key thing is the incredible drop in price that these products are incurring. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This Android tablet is the same as this Android tablet. The interesting difference is um, every year the technology is moving so quickly that I think of this as a disposable, right? Literally, it's, oh, this thing's out of date next year, so I'm going to get the new one. Well, that technology from last year is still far superior to anything on the space station, anything we've ever launched into space, right? Which means that one-year-old obsolete technology is ex has extraordinary processing power. It's virtually free. And so how do we keep up as consumers? Truly, that's the root of why Singularity University exists. Um, I had the personal experience where I built a company with some friends over 10 years and thought of myself as an expert in robotics and in biotech. Actually, there's a lot of other things happening in robotics that I didn't realize existed already because there's just so many different innovators happening. And in biotech, wow, there's just, it's extraordinary what's, it's, what's just blossoming all over the world. I had no real vision of what those things were happening. So, so how do I think of myself actually an expert in that space if I can't see all of those things? And so, so essentially that's why Peter uh, Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil started Singular University. It's, uh, it's the, the location where you can come to uh, look at all the fastest moving technology sectors and see what the latest breakthroughs are and have lots of real-time discussions about what the potential implications of those are on your business, your industry, your life, on governments, on policies. To actually start this public discourse about the potential of these technologies and what we can do with them. Rob, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. True or false, getting a tax refund is good news. The answer is false. Getting a refund means that you overpaid the IRS last year and you gave the IRS an interest-free loan. Let's take a question from a listener of my weekly radio show. Jeremy, uh, north of the border, how are you? I'm doing just fantastic, Rick. I was going to, with my new employer, fully fund the 17.5 in my Roth 401k. What are your thoughts there? No, First wouldn't recommend it for the, for the same basis. All you're doing is paying taxes now that you otherwise do not have to pay. There's, it doesn't help you create wealth. All it does is make you beholden to Congress to honor the promise that they are laying out to you between now and when you retirement. Frankly, since it doesn't create your wealth, there's no reason to take that bet. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Since I, I, my income doesn't, I don't qualify for, uh, for a Roth, uh, IRA outside an employer, what would you recommend I do from 401k for going forward here for contributing? Traditional or a Roth 401? Brandon? Traditional, Jeremy, really easy. You've got to put money in the traditional IRA because it's going to lower your taxes today. Unlike the Roth, which is a promise in the future, the traditional helps you now. If you max out your 401k at 17.5, you're going to pay three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 less to the government that you'd otherwise pay. So max it out. And if you can save beyond that, well, you mentioned you can't, you make too much money to do a Roth contribution. That's okay. Save into a taxable account, either individual or if you're married, joint or a trust, if you have a trust that's prepared. Okay. But for an employer plan, you're saying 401 versus Roth 401. Absolutely. Yeah, correct. Uh, unless good. you're in a situation where you're in a very, very low tax bracket, which right. I suspect is not the case if you can afford to fund 17.5. And he mentioned, Jeremy mentioned he can't do a Roth contribution, right, so he's, so he's got a high income. Right. It, you know, when I get this, when I have the question, should I do the Roth 401k, my, my question back to somebody is, how much do you want to pay the government now that you don't have to pay? Right. That's well, really what you're doing. Right. It's a well, big... Well, I'm the impression, you know, apparently the, the wrong assumption that you guys explained, that I'd be better off paying taxes now when inflation is going to go up. And... and that is the trap. People keep thinking that the question is the following. Here's, here's the question people are asking, and it's the wrong question, but here's the question people are asking. Should I pay the small tax today or the big tax later? And obviously, it seems that a small tax today is better than a big tax later. That seems to be the smart approach, but it's a flawed question because people are talking about it in terms of dollars when you should, in fact, be talking about it in terms of percentages. And when you deal with it in percentages, you discover that there is no difference. A small percentage today is equal to a big percentage later. There is no difference. There is no cost savings. There is no wealth creation. So let's really simplify it. It's not a question of, do you pay a small amount now versus a big amount later? No, 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 no. 
It's real simple. Do you pay now or do you pay later? Obviously, if the two are equal, and they are, paying later is a whole lot better than paying now. End of story. Most comedians don't have much in the bank, but these comedians sure bank a lot of laughs. One of the big things right now is uh, they're gentrifying DC. They're trying to trying to price people out, trying to move different people in, trying to bring the prices of the neighborhoods up. I mean, like my friends are getting mad at it. And I was just like, get a better job. I don't really, I don't. Your rent goes up. I know it's a sad thing. You don't. I mean, it's a very sad thing. But what I'm saying, like, you see it coming a mile away. You drive to a neighborhood and it's like pawn shop, pawn shop, liquor store, Whole Foods. <laughs> One of those things is not like the other. So it's, it's a crazy thing out here. Like I, I. I'm not, I'm not in a financial bind like other comics. Like, I have a day job. Uh, you guys laugh. That's important. We don't get paid a lot for this stuff. Like, it used to go, if you were bad at comedy, people would go, hey, hey, man, don't quit your day job. Like, people are still saying that, but it sounds a lot different. Like, hey, man, no, don't quit your day job. It is serious out there. You ever had Cheetos for dinner? I have. And when you know when you're low on cash, we've all been there. When you're low on cash, everybody in the family suffers, don't they? Even the pets, even your pets, right? They take a hit, right? I'm buying off-brand kitty litter, that kind of stuff. You know, my cat's stepping out of the litter box, slinging mud off his paws. He's like, Son. Jesus, look at me! I used to be a Persian. <laughs> I look like a Rastafarian, for God's sake. <laughs> When are you going to get some work? I can't live like this. <laughs> if you could ask a financial planner just one question, what would it be? Here's one a lot of folks ask. What is the biggest misconception people have about financial advisors? I guess it's that they think we're trying to sell something. Um, they don't understand that there are professionals held to a fiduciary standard to do what's in the client's best interest. It's finding about their goals, their objectives, their circumstances, and figuring out what steps they need to take to accomplish those goals. By the time we're finished, what they find out is that it really isn't as painful as they thought, that what we're trying to do is not make them save until it hurts, 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 but rather uh, optimize their financial experience, make sure they're safe, uh, and I think they always leave with a much, uh, much better sense of security about their situation and about the fact that they've got a plan looking forward uh, for the coming years. I think the biggest misconception that people have about financial advisors is probably that they can predict the future, that they have any idea what the market's going to do tomorrow, let alone six months or 12 months down the road. No question how we often look at the future is impacted by what we've learned in the past. Events, actions, even words we've experienced shape how we live our lives. Jean Edelman, my wife and business partner, takes a look at the power behind our words and the impact they have in The Other Side of Money. We learn at a very early age the power of our words when we're infants and we're learning to speak. As we get older, we test our words and we look for reactions. I think we, even in, in, as adults, we, we use our words as weapons. And so somebody can call us silly or stupid or dumb, you know, and when we're young, we kind of take that in. We've, we've given that word some power. But we have choices and we don't have to give power to those words that don't make us feel good. It's about choosing, and it's about maybe creating a little bit barrier if we're in a situation that maybe isn't so nice that those words can't hurt us anymore. But words can build people up. They can create wonderful self-esteem, wonderful self-worth. And so if we all kind of chose better words, I love you, I appreciate you, you're doing a great job, I forgive you. Forgiveness is a tremendous healer of all. We, and, and, and when we talk about the balance and creating a happy life and letting go, I forgive you. Three very powerful words. Thanks, Gene, for reminding us that this TV show is more personal than finance. And that's our show for today. I'm Rick Edelman. For The Truth About Money, see you next time. 
to learn more about the topics we discussed on this episode and a chance to ask your questions, visit our website at truthaboutmoneytv.com and stay connected by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter.